Okay. Oh, it just interrupted me to say it was recording. All right. Um, and I need to share my screen here. If it'll let me. <clears throat> How come I don't have a control to share my screen? Aileen? Hold on. Uh, I made you the post, so um, try it now, Kim. Yeah. Oh, okay, it, it'll let me do it now. Okay, let me try it again. I have the... Why am I not seeing the... I'm not seeing control to share my screen. Wait a minute, let me go to more. Hmm. It was there, it was there. <laughs> okay, let me go to speaker view. My view, speaker view. Okay. Anyway, so in, we have the biggest crowds that we have the technical issues. <laughs> I know, right? It was there. It was there a minute ago when we were. Okay, we're on there now. It should, hopefully it'll work. I've tried something else. Bear with us, everybody. Sorry about that. It was in there. I've checked speaker view. Okay, can you do it now? Back to All panelists should be allowed to do it. Great. I'm not seeing my control for. Uh oh. <laughs> okay. Hang on. Let me. <laughs> Darn it. Okay. Let me try this full screen mode. Oh, we've made our co host, and I've allowed all panelists to do it anyway. So. Um, Interesting. You should be able to do it. Um, if, if you can't get it figured out right now, maybe if you need to come back. I don't know if that'll make, make it. Uh, do you want me to um, log out and log back in? Will that do it? Um, yeah, maybe we'll try that since there seems to be quite a few technical issues going on. Um, yeah, it seems you, like maybe if you come, yeah, you're coming straight through Zoom, not Eventbrite, so that should work. Yeah, I'm I'm going straight through the Zoom link, but it seems like okay. uh, it's still not working. Um, otherwise, you can quickly email maybe the presentation to us if we can't get it working, and then we can just manually do it for you on our end. Okay, I've never let me log before, so I'm not sure what's happening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. Thanks everybody for bearing with us. There we go. It's now it's back. Okay, and can you see it? Yep. I, I hope you it. can see that. Business. Is it working? Yep. Perfect. Yay. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> okay. I didn't actually have to log back out. It I refreshed the page and it showed it showed up. So okay. So welcome. Sorry about the little glitch there. That normally doesn't happen. Um, I'm gonna talk about animal tracks and signs. And what is a track and what is a sign? So a sign, uh, excuse me, a track, everybody knows what those are. Those are footprints. Uh, many animals make them, uh, some even birds make them, uh, insects. Reptiles, amphibians, all animals that walk on the ground will eventually leave footprints. Signs are any other clue that tells you an animal has been around. And that can be anything from a nest to a feather, to a scat, a feeding sign, uh, scent marking, scratches on trees, you name it. All of those are signs. And so when I talk about uh, sign, it could include any of those. So uh, when animals move across the landscape, they have preferred ways that they move. Um, they, they choose gates. A lot of it is based upon their body type. So some animals are short animals with very short legs and wide bodies. And so they choose different gates than animals that have long legs and, and tall bodies. Um, so if you are trying to identify tracks, a lot of times it's very helpful to photograph a section of the gate of the animal. And especially if you're in an area where there's snow, and uh, if you're going to participate in any of the bio blitzes or uh, tracking things on iNaturalist, it's very helpful to give the uh, a view of the gate. So some of the animals that use things like direct register walk are deer, which also trot because they have very long, thin legs, and it's easy for them to move over obstacles. They have a narrow trail width, and uh, they use gates like this a lot. Um, felines like your uh, bobcats, domestic cats, um, lions, and lynx will use the overstep walk. And the overstep walk is um, 
a way of moving in which the front track, which is this one, lands first, and then the hind track lands ahead of the front track. And that sequence is repeated over and over in, the, in this uh, track pattern. And that would be your, um, mostly your felines, other animals can use that. One of the very typical gates of the canines is the side trot. And in that gate, you have a front track landing on one side of the trail and the hind tracks all land on the other side of the trail. So these tracks here are all hind and these tracks on this side are all fronts in this particular gate. That's a very common gate for coyotes to use and other canines. Lopes are used often by mustelids. Uh, your otters, minks will use this a lot. And in this particular type of gate, you'll have front tracks and hind tracks kind of bunched up together. Um, in the center, you'll have a front and a hind next to each other, and then you'll have a hind leading. And then there's a space and then there's another group. So here's a group of all four tracks right here, and then a space. So these animals have an airborne component to their movement so that the space in between here is where the, air, where the animal is in the air. So uh, gates like lopes and gallops have an airborne component to them. I'm not gonna get too deeply into gates other than to just show you some of the patterns um, that the animals use because it is useful for identifying them. In a gallop, which is the fastest gait that most animals can uh, use, you'll have your front tracks land first, and then the animal goes briefly airborne in a phase called gathered suspension, and then the hind tracks hit the ground next. The hind tracks will hit the ground ahead of the front tracks. And so this, a lot of times this gait looks like a very, um, very much like a very straight line, and all the tracks are in a row, and it can be easily confused for the trot because notice how the tracks are just in a line. Um, but you have to look at the tracks very carefully and determine your front from hinds. And I will show you how to do that um, during the presentation coming up here. Animals like um, chipmunks and squirrels tend to use the bound as their preferred gait. They have longer hind legs, they have short front legs, their front feet land, hit the ground, the hind, will come around the fronts and land ahead of them. The direction of travel is this direction, and you'll get this pattern where you have a, sort of a, a Y shape if you were to connect the dots between those, those tracks. So the bound is typical of your rodents. Uh, rabbits use a bound or a hop. And then the last one that I wanted to show you is the raccoon's walk, which is unique to the raccoon. It's called a two by two walk. And what happens in this gate is a front track and a hind track from the opposite side of the body will land next to each other in this gate pattern. So there's a front and there's a hind and it repeats over and over like that because they have a, an extreme overstep, uh, which means the hind track is stepping further forward of the front one. Um, you can find videos of raccoons moving on YouTube. I don't have enough time today to go over the gates in great detail. Uh, gates themselves are an entire presentation by themselves, but um, that's it, just in brief, um, some of the common gates that animals use. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me go through the, the slides. I wanted to point out that if you are going to use iNaturalist and uh, take pictures of tracks and, and uh, submit them for identification, it helps to take a few views to um, give the people that are going to identify the tracks the best chance to identify it for you. So include a, um, a photo showing a close-up of a track and a scale in the, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in the photo. So in this case, I've included a ruler over here. Um, you can find these rulers uh, down here at my website. I have also provided a, a link in a, in a document later that you can find these. Uh, print them and, and use them if you want, or just throw a coin next to a track, or some people stick their hand put in, the, in the photo to give some idea of scale. So take a close up with, with a, a um, single track, and then take another view that shows a set of four tracks, uh, because that will show you the gate usually, 
um, try to find a section that has fairly clear text if you can and include your scale. Also include an overview that shows um, how the animal was moving. So the entire trail, there are actually two otters right here, but you can see two of them moving side by side right there. And uh, that gives you a, a chance to interpret the gate. And so if you're gonna be submitting things on iNaturalist, that's, that's very helpful. Um, okay, over on the right is the, the uh, animals that I would like to talk about. And the first ones are gonna be the cat and the dog are the, uh, the most common animals that you're gonna find around here. All right, so domestic cats, I, I just want to feature them very briefly, even though they are not wild animals, they are around us. And surprisingly, in many wild areas, uh, you will find domestic cat and domestic dog tracks. So cat tracks in general show four toes and their toes are either oval or also somewhat pointed on the end. So they're a little bit of a teardrop shape. I'm not doing the best outlines here, but when you look at cat tracks, the, the first impression that I have of cat tracks is that they're very round. So you can draw a line around it and it's a relatively round outline for cat tracks. Um, the hind track on domestic cats has, the toes are in a little bit less of a steep arc than you have on the front track. So this is the front track that I'm drawing right now. And this is the hind track. And you can see how the arc is just a little bit shallower. Uh, the toes are a little closer together. And that's typical of most of the um, domestic cats. The, the wild cats are slightly different. And um, uh, scale will help, especially with cat tracks, because cats across species have very similar tracks. So in all cat species, you have a very wide pad here. and this is um, just a rough outline because there was some slippage right here where it slipped into the, into the track. But the shape is like an M almost, or like a trapezoid shape. It's very wide and very thick. And if you could imagine taking these toes, picking them up and placing them into the area covered by that palm pad, you could fit three to four of those toes in there. That's true of almost all cats especially on the front foot. Notice on the hind foot that the pad is a lot smaller, more dainty looking than it does on this front track right here. That's true of domestic cats, bobcats, and cougars. So domestic dogs are everywhere, literally even in parks where they're not supposed to be, there will be domestic dogs. Uh, dogs are related to wolves distantly. And so they are very capable of moving long distances away from humans. Domestic dog tracks are probably the number one most misidentified track out there. Uh, dog tracks have blunt claw marks and I'll show you a coyote later, but look at how thick, wide and blunt those claw marks are on this dog track. Um, another thing that trackers like to use is the um, shape of the negative space. So if you uh, think about a track, the parts that are not footprint imprints are negative space. Um, it's from the art world, the trackers. So if you imagine drawing a line there, you get relatively an X shape on the front track of a dog. The hind track, sometimes it's a little bit wider in this region, and so you can get somewhat of an H shape on a domestic dog's hind track. So that, that helps you because remember on the, um, on the cat, it was different. It was much more round in that region. So four toes on dogs. Uh, dogs have a very um, symmetrical track. So if you were to split it down the middle and draw lines across the leading edges of the toes, it would be fairly symmetrical on both sides. It's almost like a mirror image. So let's get into the wild animals here, uh, the white-tailed deer. And these are animals that are common in the wildland urban interface. So you can see them in cities, you can see them in parks, um, you can see them in wild areas. 
deer. Um, and I want to thank all the people who contributed the photos. A lot of these came from iNaturalist. I'm using the Creative Commons licensed photos. And I want to thank everybody that uh, provided the animal photos because they're excellent. Um, deer, on the deer track, there are um, four parts to the hoof. So they have two cleaves and they walk on these two here, this one and this one, uh, which are toe number three and four of deer. They have um, four toes if you count these dew claws. Now the dew claws don't always show up in every track. And the only reason that they usually show up is the animal is running fast or the animal is in a deep substrate. And so sometimes you'll see dew claws on the hind track, dew claws point forward and back, like you see here. On front tracks, they point more out to the sides. The uh, deer tracks are, are really uh, heart shaped. So if you, if you find these, they're pretty typical throughout all the families of deer. So deer, elk, moose, et cetera, have two, two cleaves to them. And if you were to draw an outline, it's mostly a heart shape with a, a very small ridge in between them. Uh, the leading edge, the pointed edge is the direction the animal is traveling. Um, and again, deer are pretty much everywhere. They are found in cities. It's not uh, uncommon to find them. Deer scats are usually found in a group uh, because deer deposit um, a lot of scat all at once rather than a single pellet um, as they go as rabbits do. So deer will actually just deposit a whole bunch of them. Um, sometimes the deer scat will clump up and it will look really big and it's very common for it to be confused with uh, bear scat. Uh, that's not unusual at all. Advance here. So that's one of the signs. That's a, another uh, sign deer leave. Another thing that deer do is they rub their antlers on trees. So the males do this during the rutting season. Um, there are several theories as to why they rub their antlers on trees. Uh, one of the theories is that they're rubbing the antlers to get the foot off them. Um, and that's a possibility. And also, uh, a, another scientific study that I read uh, proposed that, that um, they're doing it to distribute oils from a gland on the face onto the antlers, and so that when they're walking through the forest, the scent is distributed. So it creates sort of a scent cloud around them. So I like that theory, but uh, deer do a lot of rubbing on trees with their antlers. When deer rub on trees, it can resemble the sign of black bears because bears will also scratch on trees. So look for marks like this here. These are gouges up here. And those come from the tines of the antler uh, as the deer was scratching on this tree. And down here, notice this little rough area right there and how it's rough down here where the bark has been shredded at the top and the bottom of this mark. And that's typical of deer because what happens is um, the, they are rubbing their antlers up and down. And as they do that, they're shredding the bark. So bear markings don't normally so, show this shredding. Um, and sometimes you can see in bear marks, sometimes you'll actually see the claw marks and it'll be a little bit um, less messy because when deer do it, they, they literally are removing all the bark and, and they get these, these little rough areas at the top and the bottom. They have shreds of bark dangling here and there. Um, so it looks pretty messy when a deer does that. Bears make a mess too when they bite trees, but it, it looks quite different. Um, deer are also known to scent mark, especially during the rutting season, which is in the fall. And this is a mating rit ritual. Um, the males, the bucks will scratch the ground and um, scent mark there. They may also, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, scratch the leaves away so that there's bare soil. And normally right above this scrape mark, you'll find a branch because they like to rub and bite on a branch while they're doing this scent marking ritual. Okay, raccoons are another very common animal that are found in the wildland urban interface. And they are very common in urban areas. And their tracks are really cool because their tracks look just like our little handprints and footprints. Um, they show very long, 
toes. And in fact, many trackers call these fingery toes because that's what they look like, just big, long fingers. Kind of cigar shaped a little bit, bulbous at the end, and they have claw marks. The claw marks don't always show, and that's true of all animals that have claws. It's, it really depends on substrate. So a lot of uh, field guides that say they always have claws or they never have claws, it's not reliable to use that characteristic. So in animals that have claws, they will show up in certain types of substrate, but notice that this toe doesn't show a claw, this toe doesn't clearly show a claw. It just depends on how the animal was moving, the depth of the mud that they were stepping in and other characteristics like that. So this track right here is the front track. It has a much shorter heel imprint than the hind track over here. On the hind tracks of raccoons, they have a much longer heel print on their hind, and they have five toes on both the front and the hind feet. Um, raccoons show um, on the, the hind track, the toes point relatively straight forward. They don't splay out as much, which means they don't, they don't point all in all directions like they do on this front track here. There's the front, there's the hind. And notice the, the angles of the toes are just a little bit different between the front and hind track. Um, also, when you're looking at a raccoon track, you can tell left from right by looking at the outer edge of this pad here. And the outer edge of the pad is usually longer and wider than the inner edge when you can see it clearly. And this toe, which is the thumb of this track, is shorter than the pinky right here. So if you were to draw a line across there, this toe is, is a lot shorter. Um, and the same is true on the hind track. So this one is a right front track. And over here, you, you notice you have the thumb here and it's shorter than this toe here. This one is your left hind. So when raccoons walk in their typical gait, um, you will have paired tracks, and I'm going to show you their gait in a moment here. <clears throat> so here's, here's how they walk. So there are two raccoons here on the right. There's one here, and there's one going this way. So notice how those tracks are paired, and you have a front and hind and a front and hind. So in these, a lot of times in sand, the hind track will be deeper because it carries more of the weight, but that's not always true. Um, but the sequence will always be front hind, front hind, switching off like that as the animal moves through um, the substrate. And that's that typical walk that I showed you called the raccoon two by two walk. And here's an illustration of it over here showing how they have front and hind, front and hind paired and they switch off in each step. That's uh, unique to the raccoons, and uh, other animals can make this gait, but they usually don't. It's, it's something the raccoons do without even thinking about it. Opossums are also common, and they are found in urban areas. They're nocturnal animals. A lot of, fortunately, we see them after they have been hit by cars, which is very sad. Unfortunately, they, they uh, are not adapted for living around vehicles. Um, they do carry their babies on their backs. They are the only marsupial in North America. So that means that the, uh, the baby opossums are very small, not quite formed, and they crawl up to the mother's pouch. She has a pouch, just like a kangaroo. And the babies f finish their development within the pouch. I read that uh, when they're first born, 14 of them will fit into a teaspoon, they're that small. So opossums are unique. They are only marsupial, but they also have a really cool opposable thumb on their hind track. And right here, you can see the opposable thumb and it sticks out in a different direction than the rest of the, the toes. So that's essentially their thumb. And they have a really cool little hind track here. This one is the right hind. This is the big thumb right here. And here's the pinky toe right there. And the three central toes are grouped together. They almost make a little uh, a row right there. Your front track of the opossum looks somewhat like a sun rising. So it's got five toes and they normally splay out quite a lot. And so they look kind of like a little sunrise. 
I've heard raccoon track, I mean, uh, excuse me, opossum tracks described as a hot mess of toes, um, like you took a spider and dropped it from the sky and, and that's the track that it left and, and other um, very descriptive ways of describing them. They move in such a way that the hind track um, lands on top of the front track. Here's the hind and there's the front right there. So as they're moving, this, this whole thing is two tracks. It's a hind on top of a front. And it does make kind of a mess of, of toes. And it's, it can be difficult to tell which one is which, um, left versus right, front versus hind. But looking for that uh, opposable thumb will really help you to identify uh, which side of the body the tracks came from. Striped skunks, these guys are pretty fun. They're nocturnal also. Um, and this is another animal that has five toes on the front track and five toes on the hind track. Striped skunks have very long claws on their front feet because they uh, whoops, um, use these for digging. So their front toes have very long claws and the hind have shorter claws. Let's look at the tracks and in the front track, you can actually see how long those claw marks are because the claws are falling way up here ahead of these toes. So you can see the five toes and you can see a, a really flat pad here. And these are the claw marks for that track. Over here, you can see a hind track, but I don't see any, any actual claws showing up on this one, unfortunately. This is a hind with the very wide flat pad because all of the, uh, the lobes on the pad are fused and the toes are short, they're close to the, the pad. Um, and I don't see claw marks, but on the hinds, normally the claw marks are about this short. They're really, really tiny. And the little thumb would be here, but it didn't imprint. So uh, hind tracks, if you look at the outer edge of this pad, it's wider than this edge. So that makes this the left hind. So it's narrowing to a point on the inner edge and this little thumb is dropped further back in the track. On this front track, you can see how the thumb is dropped further back in the track than this, which is the pinky finger. Um, this is the right front track of the striped skunk. Five toes, long claws they use for digging, and uh, uh, just a really cool um, looking track. And some trackers say that this looks like a small bear, which is true because bears have very wide pads and they have five toes also, but uh, bears, bear claw marks don't usually show up quite that large and that far ahead of the toes. So when striped skunks move, they often use either an overstep walk or a loping gait. And striped skunks surprisingly will cover large distances of open um, terrain. And they'll usually use a lope when they're doing that because they are out in the open and they're vulnerable to predators when they do that. So here you have a front track with the long claws. You can see the claws here. Sometimes the hind track will have a bit of a pad that shows up here, but not all the time. You won't always see it. Um, you can see it in, in the one over here on the left. You can see the entire pad has showed up including the five toes there. But on this one on the right, it didn't show up, but the wider pad here and those toes are together in kind of an arc because the toes of a skunk cannot splay, they're semi-fused. Uh, so these central toes don't usually uh, splay very much, especially these three in the center here and these three in the center here. Uh, this is the front. Um, over here on the right, you have a very long claw mark showing ahead of these toes, making that the front track. So they're using a loping gait here where you have um, the sequence is front, hind, and front, and hind. And that's typical of your skunks, especially covering um, open ground. In fact, most animals that cover open ground, if they're small animals, they, they use the gates. So here's some of the cuter animals that we have that are, that are uh, 
found in wildland urban areas. And the eastern cottontail is um, the smaller of the rabbits down here. Um, cottontails are really uh, unique in, in uh, excuse me, rabbits are really unique among the animal world. They have a lot of fur on the feet. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the tracks, but they're very, um, they're obscured by fur. So you can see these thin marks here and here and here. All over this whole track is full of, of fur, which obscures the details. So if you see these tracks in snow, you don't see much detail as far as the pads and the toes. You can make out little toe pads here in the mud. You can make out very tiny toe pads, but they're not super clear on the track in the snow. And that's because they have all of the, uh, the fur on their feet. You can see that the heel on the hind tracks is a little bit longer. They don't always place the heel down on the ground. Sometimes you'll just see the toe marks on cottontails, um, which makes it kind of challenging because a lot of times you'll just see this. You'll see claw mark, claw mark, and that's it. All you'll see is just four claw marks. So they are somewhat asymmetrical on the hind feet. The front feet are very asymmetrical. They do have a fifth toe on the front foot right here. And then that's, that's toe number one on the left front. And here's the other two, three, four, and five. So there are five toes on the front feet of rabbits and there are four toes on the hind feet of rabbits. And that's opposite of what you'll learn in a moment of the rodents. Rabbits are not rodents, they're in the family Leporidae. So when rabbits move, they commonly use a gait called a bound. And in the bound, the front feet land first and they're followed by the hinds. And you get this sort of pattern right here where um, you have front and front and then the hinds land ahead of them. So these ones land first and then the hind ones land last. The hind feet come around the fronts. Sometimes in snow, that will create a mark. There will be a little drag mark here sometimes on the outside where the, the hind tree, uh, feet dragged in the snow if it's deep enough. In this case, it's the snow is not really that deep, so you don't see the drag marks. Um, direction of travel is this direction. And again, this is the, the bounding gate, and that's the typical gate of most rabbits. If you think you have rabbit versus squirrel tracks in snow, a lot of times it's helpful to follow them for a little bit and see if they end up at a tree or if they end up in the brush where, where those tracks go to. Um, that will also tell you a lot about the behavior of the animal. So rabbits can't climb trees, so you're going to find um, they, they will go to brush and concealment, whereas your squirrels will end up at a tree that they can climb. So that's your rabbits. Now, one of the signs that's pretty common from rabbits is their scats. And rabbits eat a diet of vegetation and their, their scats come out in two different ways. Now, rabbits and, and some species of squirrels have a uh, behavior called coprophagy where they will eat the first scats that come out. And this saves them uh, nutrients uh, especially in areas like deserts where there's uh, very sure. And so whatever they are able to get as far as food, they want to get as much of the nutritional value out of it as possible. So the sequel scouts, which are the first ones to come out, are um, they're really soft and the rabbits just eat those directly as they come out. Um, that's a normal behavior for rabbits and, and squirrels. Sounds kind of gross, but it does allow that to transit their their gut a second time and they can get all the nutrients out so that when they finally do um, excrete the final fecal pellets like these, they're very compact, dry. Um, they're pretty much just compressed sawdust. That's all that's left. And rabbits excrete these one at a time. Um, so if an accumulation of these in a place, that means that the rabbit was um, hanging out there for a reason for a while. So it could have been feeding right there. It could be an area that's sheltered and it's, it's sitting there um, just uh, in a sheltered spot where, where predators can't see it. But uh, 
as opposed to deer, which deposit many scats all at once in a clump, rabbits do one at a time. Some species of jackrabbits can do hundreds per day. Okay, beavers are, um, are famous aquatic rodent and they leave a lot of tracks and sign. Everybody knows what, what beaver uh, sign looks like on trees. It's pretty common. Beaver tracks show their adaptation for the water. Excuse me, so the track on the left is a front track from a beaver and are rodents, so they have four toes on their front feet and five toes on their hind. So on the right is hind track, on the left is the front track, and the toes of a beaver are fairly thick. Uh, they're very thick, beefy looking toes. Um, the front foot has a very large pad down here that does not always show up, and this toe right here didn't show very much, and there's also a fourth toe over here, or excuse me, a, a, a fifth toe, which is very tiny and almost like just a little nubbin of a toe. There's not much there. So it, it doesn't really show tracks. A lot of rodents have that very small fifth toe and so small that we don't even usually count it. Um, they do have very large and thick claws and those show up on the front and the hind tracks. On these hind tracks over here on the right, it showed up very well. Those are the blunt claws. Now the claws kind of are close to the toes, so they run into the end of the toes. Now on beaver hind tracks, a lot of time, we'll clearly see the outer three toes. So this is, this is the pinky toe right here, and toe number one is over here, but it's been obliterated pretty much in toe number two. So this is the thumb right here, which we call toe number one. And then toes are numbered from the inside going to the outside, just like on humans. Uh, five being the pinky and one being the thumb. So tiny little, tiny, tiny little um, thumb there. And also notice that right in here in this region, those toes are hard to see. And the reason is the flat tail, when they walk, the tail often will sweep out the track and leave nothing of this half of the track. So all this will be gone. In, in a lot of times in a beaver trail. And sometimes all you will see is these three toes right here from a beaver. So it's pretty rare to find a complete front track from a beaver. Um, when you do, it's, it's kind of cause for celebration. They're not, not that easy to find. You can see a little hint of webbing between those two toes on the right there. So when beavers move, a lot of times they are um, in deep substrates because they live on waterways and normally the substrates right next to a waterway are deep mud or sand, wet sand. And so sometimes you get really nice tracks like this. Um, one thing to look for with their trails is a drag mark from the tail. So right here in the center, you can see kind of a little bit of a drag mark there from the tail. And in this case, you've got very nice complete hind tracks and these hind tracks are huge um, compared to the size of the front track. The front track is relatively small. Some animals, it's the opposite. The front track will be larger. On beaver, otters, the uh, hind track is the larger of the two front and hind. Um, direction of travel is in that direction. And this is a walking gate and that's probably the most common gait you're going to find, they can do other gaits, they can bound, but um, they're usually going to walk. All right, so the other sign that you will find from beavers is this one over here on the right. This is uh, mostly, it looks like a tail dragging. So this, this long trough right here in the center is from the tail. And you notice how this hind track right here shows three toes, but the inner two toes are missing because it's uh, it's been dragged by the tail. Uh, another thing is uh, drag marks from branches, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, this drawing in the center exaggerates the track details because you don't always see the web. 
that clearly. And in fact, you hardly ever see these toes. Um, and over here on the left, see what happens to the striations in the soil right here that indicate the tail dragged out the marks that were made by these toes. So they're, they're missing right in here and right in here, they're missing. Very thick toes. You can see some knuckles in there. They're, they've got really big knuckles, imprints that you can see at the toes usually. The tips are very best. So beaver tracks are pretty much unmistakable in this region. Um, they, they can resemble alligator tracks, but of course there are no alligator tracks in this region. So there's pretty much nothing else you can use this beaver track with uh, because they are so large. Behind. So another common yeah. sign, excuse yeah. me, go ahead. Uh, your sound is getting a bit um, funny on this end. It's getting a bit tinny, tin, tinny um, and cutting in and out. It just started oh. in the last minute. I don't know if um, something changed on your end, but just letting you know. Um, okay, yeah, I did get a little notification that said my internet connect connection is unstable. Oh. Oh no, okay. Hopefully it'll stabilize. It's, <laughs> it's yeah, yeah hope, hopefully it'll stabilize. I use a I use a um a hotspot for internet, so sometimes uh, it does. Yeah. Okay. It'll, it'll probably uh, it, it might hopefully it doesn't go in and out. But. Okay. Well, I'll let you know if, if we do like totally lose sound, I'll let you know. But sounds okay, like yeah, give me a, okay. okay. Yeah, let me know for sure. So um the sign of the beavers in this case. Uh, is the drag marks left when they're dragging branches. So these little striations right here are the drag marks from when a beaver was dragging a branch. And this is very common uh, going to and from waterways. In this case, you can see this wide, thick mark here in the center of this trail. That's from the tail. So this is, this is the flat mark from the tail. But over on the side, you can see these striations that were made when the beaver was dragging vegetation towards the water. And that's a very common sign. And in fact, that's a good indicator of beaver's presence. Even if you don't find really good tracks, you will often find these drag marks. And those are indicators that beavers are around. As well as if you uh, go up to the vegetation near any waterway and you find uh, where things have been chewed off, this is the, the typical sign. Everybody is, has probably seen this and recognizes this sign as coming from beavers. Another thing to look for with beavers is scats. Now scats are normally deposited in the water and their scats look like just a bunch of uh, um, shavings, wood shavings, compacted together in a little pellet. And normally they're deposited in water. So if you find these, it's either you know, in a stream where the water has receded or you know, for whatever reason they, they have dewatered they normally deposit them right in the water. It's hard, it's uh, something you don't see very often. Okay, muskrats is, are another species that are found near waterways. And again, this animal has the typical rodent um, track form with four toes on the front and five toes on the hind. They have that little tiny reduced toe number one that shows up on some rodent tracks, but it's hard to see. And you can see over here that this hind track here has stepped on the front track and eliminated any possibility of seeing toe number one. So you can see the four toes, but you don't see the, uh, the fifth toe in that, that front track there. The hind track shows the typical five toes of a rodent. Oftentimes in rodent, the three central toes will be grouped together almost in a row. They will splay in rodents because they're not connected like they are in skunks, but um, they are often grouped so that you could draw a line across the front of them. It gives the front of the track a relatively flat appearance. Um, sometimes in really good substrate, you can see the fringe that's on the outside of the, the toes that help support the muskrat in um, mud. And in this, in this particular set of tracks, it's not as clear. Um, but I will show you another set in which it's much easier to see. Um, so they commonly use a walking gait. And so in walking gaits, you have a very wide, oops, 
you have a very wide in that direction and this direction. Um, you have a wide straddle. So straddle, you draw a line on the outside of the trail and then you measure this distance between the outside edges of the trail. And the wider the straddle, um, the slower the animal's moving in general. Um, as you speed up, you get a, a narrower straddle. So they prefer a walking gait. And in this case, because the uh, front track landed ahead of the hind consistently, excuse me, that's a front, and this was a hind, uh, consistently, this is an understep walk. So this is a slower gait than an overstep because in an overstep walk, the hind track will land ahead of the front. And that just indicates that the animal was walking faster. So this was just a beautiful set of tracks from one of our cyber tracker evaluators, Jonah. Um, and you can see here this fringe that is around the toes. And what that does is it gives those toes a little bit more surface area so that the animal has an effect like a snowshoe that it can use for walking in mud because it does, these animals live near water and of course they need to be able to uh, support their body weight when they're in very deep mud. And if, as anybody knows that's ever stepped in the mud, um, it certainly, you can sink into it quite well. So the, the animals like the beaver and the muskrat, their feet show that adaptation to their lifestyle. And just as uh, flip over a duck and look at its track or its foot, you would see webbing on the feet because it, it is another animal that lives in an area of um, substrate that is commonly very um, squishy and that they can sink into. So animals show adaptations to their lifestyles in their... Okay, sometimes in muskrat tracks or trails, excuse me, you will find a tail drag. And that's not uncommon to find. Um, just like with the beaver, the tail dragging there. And uh, it's just uh, another trait to look for. Um, it's one of those um, not always and not never sort of characteristics to look for, but it can be diagnostic if you find little tracks that are about the right size. And even though this animal has five toes, it's only showing three clearly. And you find a tail drag and you find um, this typical rodent morphology of the feet. That's uh, a good clue to suspect that um, you found muskrat tracks. So another thing that, that a lot of animals do, including muskrats, is they will scent mark. And in this case, there is a mound of soil that's been scratched up. And on top of that mound of soil is a scat or several scats right here. Um, this is a typical um, scent marking type of behavior. Several animals will do this. Um, the ones that scrape together mounds like this are your beavers, Muskrats will do it. I've seen otters do it. Um, and sometimes there will be scat on top of it. Sometimes it will be just the mound and they will urinate on it sometimes. Otters have their own particular type of uh, scented, um, uh, it's called otter jelly. It's basically a excretion from their intestines that they will often deposit on top of their scent marks. But um, scent marking is common in many animals and some of them be very, uh, characteristic sign like this. Um, you can see right here, there's a tail drag through it. There's some clear tracks over on the left over here. So this all points to muskrat sign rather than beaver. Okay, your river otters. And uh, this little guy was uh, in a river near me and, and I was crunching up a fish and, and I kind of swam up to see him and got within four feet to get this picture of it underneath the bank. And the otter kind of was staring at me like, what are you doing? So that was kind of a fun picture to get right there. Um, river otters are another species whose tracks show the type of lifestyle they live. So if you live in water, you need to be able to swim and having webbed feet helps really give you a lot of uh, swimming power. So the otters have web webbing on their feet and it does not always show in their tracks. In this case, it showed up because this mud was so nice and deep and 
and it just left perfect imprints of the webbing. Otters have five toes on their front and five toes on their hind. The front is on the left and the hind is on the right. Um, front tracks are a little bit more symmetrical than hind. So you could imagine right down the middle of that track and cutting it in half. Those two halves would be close to a mirror image of each other. Whereas on this hind track, if you were to cut it in half, notice that this thumb is way further back than this pinky toe. So this is not a symmetrical track. So that's one way to tell the front from the hind on the otter. Um, the other one is sometimes otters will show this little pad right here behind the front track and the hind track will usually show a completely rounded heel um, if you have good enough substrate, good enough mud to show that characteristic. So left versus right on otters, uh, look for the finger that is furthest back. In this case, it is this toe number one, the, the, the thumb. Um, and also look at the shape of the pad. So the pad itself kind of comes up a little in shape. The outer lobe is wider than the inner lobe. So this one is really narrow. This one is wide. Uh, it tapers to a point over here. So this is the left track. Um, all those characteristics, so this, this thumb being further back and the shape of that pad tell you this is the left track. Now on the hind track, it's a lot easier because you need to look for this, this thumb right here. That's the equivalent of your thumb. This is the equivalent of your toe number one, toe number five. This is the left thumb and it is further back in the track if you draw an imaginary line. It is further back in the track than the pinky is. And also examine the pads here. These are called the metatarsal pads, um, but each, each one of these pads is protecting a bone in the foot. So we have them also in our feet, um, metacarpal in our hands and metatarsals in our feet. But in this case, it, it makes a pad that's kind of shaped like a V almost. And there are four pads here. One of them is for toe number one. This one is for toe number two. Toes three and four share a single pad, and that's true in many mammals. And toe five shares that pad. So uh, on your mustelids, your otters and your mink, that will be the structure to look for in those pads. So it looks um, very much like, excuse me, a V shape on the pads, especially the hind track, and the hind track being very um, asymmetrical. Also look for blunt claw marks and bulbous toes. So the toes are really round and chubby looking toes there, um, as opposed to the raccoon that we saw earlier. Remember the raccoon, the toes were, were long and thin and, and looking more cigar shaped. So that will tell you otter versus raccoon. The, the, the animal that is within the same size range as the otter is the raccoon. So you can see over here, especially, how this track could be confused with a raccoon track. Um, pretty much, sometimes you have to look at them side by side, but using the more bulbous toes, a little bit shorter looking toes, this, the shape of this pad and how it shows lobes will help you to differentiate this from the raccoon because raccoons have a very uh, smooth C-shaped edge to that pad and it's not low it's in your otters. So those are river otter tracks, front, and, front on the left, hind on the right. River otters, again, use that gate that I talked about. The, uh, they use lopes, uh, they will use bounds and gallops. Um, they prefer a lope, it seems to me. Um, they, they will just get out on a river bar and just start loping along. And if you see them doing it, they kind of look like a rocking horse as they're moving. Uh, it's pretty entertaining to watch. Otters also will come out onto riverbanks and they will roll in the sand and they'll slide. Uh, we've, we all know that they slide in snow, but they also slide in the sand. So see these marks here? These are the marks from an otter sliding in the sand. And so this is called a haul out area. And a lot of times what they do is there will there'll be a family group of otters or, um, or even a single otter. They'll come out on the river bar 
they'll roll in the sand and they'll just push themselves along just like they would, you know, sliding in snow. And um, it's a scent marking ritual. A lot of times they will deposit scat in these fallout areas. They will um, deposit that stuff that I call otter jelly, which is just a clear sort of yellowish secretion that comes from their intestines. And it, it is very highly scented. And so otters will use that scent mark. Otter scats typically show a lot of remains from their prey. In this case, this was taken in my area. So there are a lot of crayfish in here. There are also um, some remains of dragonfly naiads, which are in my river. That's where I took this picture. Um, right here, you can see one of the dragonfly naiads. But a lot of times you'll see fish bones, you'll see fish scales, um, coproliths will be in there. So there's, there's a lot of um, things that you can find in otter scats. And if you pick them apart, you can kind of determine what the otters have been uh, eating in your area. Otter scats are often deposited in latrines. So they will develop well-used places that multiple otters will visit as they swim by that particular area of river and they'll haul out on the bank. They might do their rolling rituals and uh, the rolling serves to also maintain their fur and distribute oils in their fur so that they maintain their, their waterproof ability. It also is a place for them to deposit scent. So after a part of that, and, um, it's very common to find latrines where there are multiple scats from multiple otters. Sort of like the otter post office. Okay, our stellid that lives near water and has five toes on the front and the hind track is the mink. And they're very cute. <laughs> okay, so mink have tracks that look very much like otter tracks, but they're smaller. And when I look at mink tracks, one of the things that I key into is how pointy their toes can sometimes look because their claws are right there at the tip of the toes. And so they get this pointed appearance to them. And it's, it's just kind of interesting that mink tracks usually show that, whereas otters will often show a bigger, beefier toe right here than the mink do. So front versus hind on mink tracks, you can look on the front track and sometimes see this round pad which you can see over here on this drawing. So this is the front and that is the hind. And this one is the front and you can see that pad, which is the carpal pad. It's uh, equivalent to the, the heel. Now on the hind track, you don't see that pad. Here's a hind track right here. And one thing to note on the hind track is these two central toes right here are closer together than they are here. They're, if you draw a line across them, they're very uh, symmetrical looking, almost like a canine track in its symmetry. So you can draw that in half and, and uh, it, that's because the hind track, the symmetry is, is thrown off a little bit because this thumb or toe number one is so far back in the track that if you didn't see this, if it was obliterated, this, this track itself would look very much like a canine track. And that's how I usually uh, look at them and try to determine front versus hind. Look for the dropped thumb, which is this one, the inner toe. This is the pinky toe here. And then just look at that symmetry of that track overall. And you can also draw sort of an arc in the negative space of the front track here and a little bit more V-shaped on the hind track here. So that's your mink. Um, their tracks don't show as much of that webbing as otters do. Um, even though these guys swim, I've rarely seen any kind of indication of webbing in a mink track. So they are mustelids and they have five toes front and five toes hind. Sometimes mink tracks in firm substrate will not show the claws and it'll look like this right here with a very rounded sort of toe imprint track by itself could be easily confused with the front track of a squirrel because squirrels show the four toes like that and this this palm pad here 
looks almost just like a squirrels, but this is a mink. Um, you, a lot of times, if you find confusing tracks like this, it helps to follow them out further and try to find other tracks in the sequence because you will come upon ones like this where you've got those uh, claw edges that are a little bit more pointed and will help you determine that this is not a squirrel track. So uh, follow them out. Also examine the gate that they're using. So on the right over here, you've got two tracks and two tracks in uh, what I call a two by two lope. Um, mink use this particular method of movement a lot. It'll be a front track with a hind track on top of it and a front track with a hind track on top of it. That's very common. Uh, squirrels can do this, but they rarely, rarely do it. So if you have a confusing track like this one in the center here, that's where the gate will come in and it will help you. So uh, remember those gates that I talked about initially, if you're going to photograph tracks, try to get a view of the gate as well as the individual tracks and it will help you to identify them later. Um, and again, they have very super pointed toes. And here is that typical shape to the pad where it's very V-shaped almost. So these, these two tracks show it pretty well. This one shows it somewhat well, but that's typical of mustelids in general is that V-shape to the pads. All right, let's move on to some canines and red foxes. And these guys are, are uh, another nocturnal species. Um, they have been called the cat-like canine. And the, uh, the tracks of these guys don't look very cat-like though to me. So if you've seen red foxes feet or if you've seen their tracks, one thing that you usually notice is that they're just full of fur. Um, their feet get more furry in the wintertime. And you can see striations in the track here and here. You can see all these little fur marks in there. And in the center right here, you can see all these little marks there. This is just full of fur. So this is a, a good indicator of a red fox track is the amount of fur in the foot. Um, another indicator that is really good for gray, or excuse me, red fox is this particular pad here, which is somewhat V-shaped. I didn't draw that very well. Um, somewhat V-shaped and it's, it's this uh, callus type bar that is in there. They're more clear in their front tracks. It's a little bit clear in the hind right here. You can see a little bar, but um, that's one indicator of the red fox. Another indicator of red fox is a large negative space. So all this blank space between the toes here, this is the negative space. Anything that is not a toe print, we call negative space. And so their tracks have a very large amount of it because there's so much fur on their feet. And the other thing to notice, these are canine tracks, so they are very symmetrical. Drawing lines across the leading edges of the toes gives you a very symmetrical view. If you split that track right in half and you look at the mirror images, they're very close to each other. So this side matches that side. Um, that's another characteristic of canine tracks is that symmetry. And that's true for your dogs, your coyotes, or red fox, gray fox, etc. cetera. Um, wild canines, their claws tend to be sharp and thin. And so when you see claw mark from wild canines, they're gonna be just tiny little pinpricks ahead of the toes. And um, they're, they're gonna be just, um, subtle, much more subtle than on a dog. Dogs we saw with big blunt and round claw marks on them. So these are the beautiful red fox tracks. Um, and remember the negative space on those guys because you can see that in the snow too. So here in the snow, you can do the thing that we, we do on dog tracks and make that X shape in the negative space if you follow those lines in between the toes, you can kind of make an X shape on the front and a relatively H shape on the hind. But the thing to note on these tracks is the large amount of negative space in the center here. So 
all of this that I'm kind of outlining, that's all negative space. It's not the toes. That's, that's all just negative space. They have very tiny pads for their toes. They're, they're just kind of subtle. They're not very clear because this, this entire toe is covered with fur. So it's the, the toe imprints are not very clear. The clearest thing on red fox tracks a lot of times is going to be that bar in the heel. So look for that characteristic bar in the heel, and that will help you identify these as red fox tracks. Now, these were just a beautiful set, and it shows very nicely how much fur these guys have in their, on their feet, and very clearly the bar right here. This is the, that calloused pad that's on the foot. This is the, the front foot. So front feet on canines, usually are wider than the hinds. This is the hind over here. And this is the front here. Um, they're also usually quite a bit larger and rounder. If you were to do an outline, the hind track tends to be more oval on most canines. And that's, that's true of your wild species as well as domestic dogs. Although domestic dogs can vary drastically because there are just so many domestic dogs that it's hard to make a good generalization like that about their tracks. Okay, a, a typical gait. Um, red foxes being wild canines, they can use um, a number of the, the gates that indicate wild animals. Now dogs, when they get outdoors, they wanna run around and explore and check everything out and sniff everything. So they tend to meander, their trails go all over the place. Whereas your wild canines, they have a more purposeful gait, more straight line trails. They're, they're going in a single direction. They're, they're not meandering. And wild canines also will use this gait called the side track, <clears throat> in which the hind tracks all land on one side and the front tracks all land on the other of the direction of travel. And this pattern just repeats over and over um, as the animal trots. And it's accomplished by holding their body at a slight angle as they trot. And that the uh, theory is that that's to prevent the front and hind foot from colliding as they, they move forward. So here's another of the common canines that will be uh, found in urban areas. In fact, coyotes in many places are, are very common in cities. Um, they, they adapt very well to living near humans. Um, they, they are able to survive quite well near us and our presence. Again, they're a wild canine. So normally their claw marks are very sharp and very thin. Um, a lot of times the claw marks, especially the leading claws, will almost point inwards toward each other. They're, they're close together. And on coyotes in particular, the outer toes, the claw marks are just very tiny or they're so close to the inner toes that they're hard to even see. They're hard to even make out. And this one, I can't even see one. So those outer two toes, um, the claw marks will be very reduced. Um, in, in this one over here, I don't even see a claw mark. Uh, where there's two bleeding claws up there. So thin, sharp claws, outer claws, sometimes not showing. That's a, a good indicator of a coyote track. Um, they also have fur on feet. It's not as quite as extensive as in the red fox, but you can see indications of fur in this, in this foot, in the negative space, and in these guys on the left here. So the negative space is full of fur. That varies with time of year also. So during the uh, winter months, they will have more fur on their feet than during the summer months. So coyotes, their front foot is a lot wider. It's wide and long and the hind foot is a lot longer than it is wide. So if you were to make your, um, your imaginary drawing around the tracks, the hind track is going to be very oval in shape, more egg shaped than the front track. It has a tendency to be wider in the middle of the region, right here in the central region here, it's wider. 
and less, less uh, dainty looking than the hind track. On coyotes, sometimes this path hind track will show up just as a dot. And these two edges right here to that pad are so small and dainty, sometimes trackers call them wings because they look like the wings of a bird. And it's very typical to just see this particular pad in the center only on the hind track. And that pad is about the same size as one of the toes. So that's an indicator of the hind track. The front track, um, again, will have that negative space that uh, shows a lot of fur at some times of the year. Sometimes, you know, you're gonna see more of an H shape than you will an X shape on canine tracks. And that's true with your dog breeds as well. So look for negative space, look for the claw marks, look for the outer toes to have very sharp that don't, uh, uh, excuse me, are not very obvious like they are in dogs. And also on coyotes, look for these outer toes to be tucked in kind of behind these leading toes right here in a very neat fashion. So, so there's not much negative space here in the center. The, the track is less splayed than in a dog. And the toes all point relatively forward. So that thing will differentiate them from domestic dogs. Dog toes tend to splay. So if you have a dog, your toes are gonna to go uh, pointing in all different directions. And it, it looks uh, wider because the toes splay more. Um, one of the theories is that wild canines have very strong muscles in their feet. And so they are able to hold their toes together when they're walking and they don't splay quite as much. Uh, these are both front tracks, and I thought it illustrated the uh, um, another point that some trackers make is that these outer toes can at times appear larger than these inner toes. So this one is the outer toe, this is the inner toe, inner toe, outer toe. So if you were to draw an outline, this toe appears wider and longer than this particular, than the front toes do. So that's another characteristic that sometimes shows up in coyote tracks. It's not really as predictable as some of the other characteristics. You really have to have good mud to be able to see it. Uh, the other thing you can see here is the symmetry of these tracks. And you know, if you were to draw your imaginary line down the center of this track, it would be a mirror image. And the coyote tracks tend to be very uh, clearly mirror imaged. Uh, Sometimes that varies in dog tracks. So coyotes can cover large amounts of uh, ground. They're, they're sort of like wolves in that way that they can just lope along and, and, uh, or trot along. And they cover large um, distances comfortably keeping that same gait for miles. On the left here is the side trot. And remember that's the gate where um, I said that the front tracks are all on one side of the line of travel and the hind tracks are on the other. You can tell these are front tracks because they're larger, they're, they're more round, the, the hind track is a little bit more oval. So this, this continues the entire uh, distance that this animal is traveling side trot, where all the hind tracks fall on one single uh, side of the line of travel. Over on the right, this is more like the overstep walk that they use uh, when um, slowly, they could be slowly hunting, they could just be kind of checking things out and going slower. So notice that in this gate, if you were to kind of draw a line on the outside, there is a large straddle between these, these two uh, sides of the trail, whereas in this side trot, the this, this straddle is very narrow because it's a faster gate. And the other thing to note is the distance between the tracks. So in these tracks on the right, there's uh, not as much distance between the tracks or the sets of two as there is over here. So there's a larger distance between sets of two in the, in the, uh, the side trotting gate than there is in the walking gate. They can cover a large, large amount of ground using that. Okay, chipmunks, we're getting into the rodents now. So rodents are um, 
really cool. They have four toes on their front foot. And a lot of times they will show their tiny inner toe number one, but it's very rare to see it. It's this tiny little toe right here. And you have to have really good substrate in order to see toe number one on a front foot of a rodent. Um, this is the bounding gate in which the two front tracks land first and then the hind tracks come around and land ahead of them. Direction of travel is toward the top here. And you can see it here in this, in this particular track in the snow. These are the front tracks. And then the hind tracks are these longer ones here. So as the animal moves, it's, it's longer hind leg will come around land ahead of the fronts. The fronts lift off and then the animal pushes off from the hind into the next stride. And the propulsion comes from the hind legs. So oftentimes you'll, you'll see a slightly different imprint from the hind and also they're longer because sometimes the whole field will show up. Um, and in that, that method of moving using the bounding gate, uh, you have a long distance in between the sets of tracks. So here's a set of tracks, here's a set of tracks, and then here's a set of tracks up here. So you have all four feet are right here and all four feet are right here, but this is the stride distance as the animal is leaping in between those, those uh, sets of tracks. Um, sometimes I have had people ask um, if these are the tracks of a single larger animal thinking that because it, it looks like this, it has four toes, um, but those are actually feet. They're not the, uh, not the uh, toes of a larger animal. They're all four feet of a very small animal. So when you have very clear substrate, you can see the form of a rodent foot. So the rodent's front feet have four toes. The tiny little toe number one, the thumb is right here. And then you have the other four toes here. Sometimes they are connected to the palm. The palm on a rodent usually has three parts to it or three lobes. If you can see really clear uh, in the substrate, you'll see the lobes. There's these three lobes here. Um, but that is very good substrate to even be able to see that level of detail. Normally, the front tracks land paired. So these ones are the fronts here. And up here are the hinds. And again, the direction of travel is here. This is a bounding gate. These tracks landed first and the hind tracks landed second. And then the animal pushed off into the next stride. So these aren't the most super clear hind tracks either, but there are three toes here in the center that are usually grouped in most rodents. You'll have a single thumb and a pinky over here, and then you'll have the pad in the center, and the pad often has is broken up into four lobes, but you can't see it here very well. Um, I should have some better ones for you to look at. But that's the chipmunk, typical gait. And sometimes in perfect substrate, you will get that fingery appearance where their toes are connected to the palm pads. And these are just beautiful because you can actually see little palm pads in here and they have four. So what happens is toe number one has its own pad, toe two has its own pad, three and four share a pad. Remember that with the uh, mink and the otter did the same and toe five has its own pad. So there's a similarity there in that toe three and four share a pad on the hind foot of, of rodents also. So that's the hind. And this is the front. So look for the typical four toes. It's not quite as clear here, but there are four toes and a pad on the front and five toes and a pad on the hind. So that's your rodent structure. And that's gonna be true for most rodents, except for the porcupine, which looks quite different. Okay, these little guys, gray squirrels, these are fun. They're busy uh, most of the year. And they store nuts, they uh, create nests, so they gather nest material, they leave a lot of sign behind. Uh, squirrels also have that typical rodent structure, just like what we looked at with the um, chipmunk. 
So you have this, this is the right front track here. And notice how you have a tiny little toe number one with its own pad here. And then you have the three pads here in the center that make up <clears throat> the palm. This extra pad is the carpal pad, which covers the carpal bone, equivalent to the heel of our hand, the outer part of the heel of our own hand. So, and then they have four toes. So this is the typical structure of the front track of a rodent. This is the, the squirrel, gray squirrel. The same is true on their hind track. They have four pads on the hind, and then they have five toes. So the central three toes on most of the squirrels, chipmunks, those central three toes, toes excuse me, are grouped. So if you draw an imaginary line across them, they are sort of level. Um, sometimes you'll see claw marks, sometimes not, but those three toes are grouped. So we call this a one, three, one grouping. And that's uh, another way to uh, learn the rodent tracks is this one has four and so you have four in an arc. And then over here, you have a one, three, one group of the toes on the hind. This, this one is the left hind. So again, this animal is using the bounding gate where the front tracks landed first and the hind tracks went around them and landed ahead of them. And then the animal pushed off into the next uh, jump. So right here, what I wanted to show is those three toes are in a row on both hind tracks. Even though these are not the super clearest tracks in the world, this is a slight variation on the gate that I was talking about. So remember in the previous slide, how these front tracks landed behind the hinds. In this case, the hinds are behind the fronts. And this is a gate that we call a hop. It is a slower gait than the bound. Um, the front tracks are ahead of the hinds. So if these hind ones pass the fronts, that is a faster gait. Uh, it's much slower this way. Um, and this is uh, what rabbits do sometimes when they're moving slowly and just kind of foraging along. They will hop with their uh, hinds behind the fronts. But uh, when animals are moving across, open spaces or places where they feel exposed, they will use the bounding gate because it's a little faster and it allows them to move through those open areas where they feel vulnerable to predators. So this, this is just a variation on a rodent gate called a hawk. And in snow, you can see how these could easily be confused for four toes of one animal, right? Um, it's, it's been, uh, very common on iNaturalists to uh, have these be confused, but it's actually for feet of a small animal. So sometimes taking a step back and, and getting a little perspective on the trail will help you. Um, in this case, you're, you're seeing a small animal, four feet, not one large animal with uh, small toes. So direction of travel is in that direction. Your smaller imprints are your front feet, and your larger imprints are the hind. So they're usually a size difference that you can see in snow. Even if you can't see clear tracks, you'll see the pattern, which is the bound, and that will help you to uh, narrow it down to either rodents or rabbits, and then uh, look, uh, follow it if you can. If you can follow it long enough, and it ends up at a tree, that's another clue towards rodent versus rabbit. Also, when rabbits use this gate, a lot of times the track will be staggered a little more right here. Uh, the front tracks will be more staggered. So it will again help you to differentiate rodent from rabbit. Another sign that you will find, and this is common in the fall when trees are producing their, their mast, um, acorns, walnuts, any type of nut, squirrels will gather them and they'll dig holes and bury them. Now, gray squirrels are scatter hoarders. There are two types of mammals, there's scatter hoarders and there's larder hoarders. So the larder hoarder would be like the red squirrel, which stores large amounts of cones in one storeroom, like a burrow or a hollow tree. 
and a scatter hoarder like a gray squirrel will bury individual nuts or cones in different locations. So they're scattered all over the place. Um, in this case, the squirrel dug up the, um, the nut and you can see the hole where the nut was and how it had uh, tried to bury it. I've also found um, gray squirrels, at least I have the Western gray squirrel, but I've also found them making dummy caches that, that fool an animal into thinking that they buried something there when they had not. So there actually was no nut in it. Brown rats. Now these little guys are, are um, they're kind of cute, but they're also kind of destructive. Um, I've had rats uh, get into things. They love to chew on things. Um, unfortunately, they can be very destructive to human uh, storage type things. But uh, there are several things to look for. Um, their tracks are rodent tracks, but notice how their front feet the outer toes splay outward quite a bit, a lot more than what we saw in those chipmunk tracks. So there's almost a straight line across those outer toes, and that's true on the front and the hind. Notice how they splay. There's just almost a uh, almost 180 degrees between those toes. So that's one thing to help differentiate them from the squirrels. Um, they again have that same structure, with toe number one being super tiny and then four toes on the front feet, this one being the left front, and then they have the typical five toes on the hind feet. Um, the toes sometimes will show up as connected to the palm, but not always. And they again have four pads here, um, but if they show it, there are two extra pads on the hind feet, which may or may not show up. It depends on this type of substrate that you have. Um, leaving kind of a, a pattern like that where the long, uh, the hind track looks a little bit longer. You won't always see all six pads. In fact, you don't always see all four on these tracks. But uh, rat tracks in general still exhibit that rodent characteristic where the three central toes are grouped. So you have that one, three, and one type of grouping on the hind track. And whereas the front track just has four. So that's, um, Another thing to look for, my, my main thing between rats and squirrels is just look for that 180 degree uh, angle between those outer toes because rats usually display their toes quite a lot. Um, and sometimes if you have really good substrate, you can see a little bit of ribbing in the toes. Now right here, it's not that great, it's a coarse sand, but sometimes you can actually see ribbing in the toes um, which is another thing you can see on vole tracks, but rat tracks also show that in very clear substrate. You're going to need silt or something like that to be able to see that characteristic. They also have small claws, which do not always show up in their tracks, but you can, you can sometimes see the, the claws. They tend to use the bound as their preferred gait, um, and you'll find them in, in uh, year-round. Bulls are tiny little rodents with short little tails, and these guys are pretty cool. They're they're vegetarians, and they have so the structure, but their little um, front feet, they don't have very wide pads. It's more of a a longer, narrower pad than you see on squirrels and chipmunks. And again, their front toes point forward, and the outer toes point relatively straight to the sides. But what I like to look at on voles is this angle between their toe two and three, excuse me, three and four on their front track is sort of a V shape. So V for vole. Look for that V for vole. It's very helpful. And the reduced paths um, on both the front and hind tracks of vole. So in case actually you have the hind track showing up just as these three toes. There's a very small hint of a toe here and a small hint of a toe here, but there's very little indication that there's a pad right there. So voles often will, will leave tracks that um, their hind foot does not show up the, the pad that well. And when it does, it's more narrow than it is on other similar sized species. And look at the width of the toes, because on mice, 
they're more bulbous. The toes are a little bit thicker at the end, but on voles, they're a fairly uniform length, or excuse me, width their entire length. So they're, they're very straight, narrow toes on a vole. Voles will also make little holes. Uh, I have found these where they actually, uh, they, the burrow has, um, has scats in it. Um, sometimes they take little bits of grass down there. A lot of times the entrance will be clear of grass because they fed upon it. Um, over here on the left, this is sort of a, a typical walking gate of a vole, but note the V for vole on those toes on the front track and also the typical rodent grouping of those three central toes right here on the hind track. And they're using a walk right here uh, voles are a little bit more likely to use uh, walks than, uh, than some of the other rodents because they have a, a relatively uh, wide body. In this case, it was walking through the snow um, and you can see kind of the paired um, marks in there. Um, this is what a trail looks like in uh, grass, in a, a little grassland environment. See this area right in here where vegetation has been kind of cleared, there's a tunnel, there's a, I mean, a, not a tunnel, a trail. And within that tunnel, there are scats. And voles are known for marking with their scats within their tunnel systems. And it's a territorial thing with them. They will mark objects that are new in their tunnels. And they also deposit scats randomly, but they also make latrines where there are large accumulations of scats within their tunnels. Another thing to look for with, with voles is feeding signs. So trackers call this a 45 degree angle on the cut right here. Um, this is a rush, not a grass. Um, but that particular angle is one that most rodents will show in their feeding sign uh, and also rabbits. In this case, I pulled this out of that hole that I just showed you and there were vole scats inside. So I was able to confirm that this was done by the vole. They will uh, cut pieces of vegetation and bring them into their tunnels to eat later, which is what this guy did. Oops. Okay, here are what vole scats look like. Now, vole scats look a little bit different than mouse scats because they're more pelletized. They're more, um, I don't know, what a, a smooth edged and very um, rounded on the ends, more like little pellets. Mice have a little bit rougher texture to their scats. And again, the location will help you if you find these in a voles tunnel. Obviously, it's going to be a voles scat. Mice are super cute. They're a white-footed mouse and deer mouse in the area. Mouse tracks, again, have that typical rodent structure where the hind tracks, which this one is, have a toe number one, which is the thumb. And the three central toes are grouped. And the toe five, which is the pinky right there. Again, they have four pads, and that's just the typical rodent structure. <coughs> Excuse me. This one is a left hind because this, this little toe, number one, thumb, is uh, dropped further back in track than is this toe here, toe number five. So if you draw a line across the, the leading edge of the pad, that uh, thumb is way further back in the track on, on the, uh, the mouse. Um, so on good, clear front tracks, you will see the four toes, uh, the structure that you have in, in uh, most of the rodents. You'll have the four toes, and you'll have the tiny little toe number one showing up. All right, here are some front tracks. Uh, one, this one is going in that direction, and this one up here is going in that direction, and you can see four toes. And toe number one would be down here. And then there are three pads here. And they're very tiny, uh, five millimeters or, or thereabouts. They're, they're not really large at all. And uh, there, there are many species of mice and it's very tough to tell them apart from their tracks alone. Habitat will tell you some, to some degree, um, range maps can help also, but um, they're, they're pretty much impossible to tell them apart by their track, you have something like a harvest mouse and a jumping mouse, which have different track morphologies. 
there are bulbous tips to these toes. Remember how on the vole, the toes were very straight? In this, in this case, on the mice, the toe tips end in little bulbous tips. So that helps you tell them apart from the voles. They have thicker toes. There's the scat on the left there. It's a little bit rougher on the outside than the vole scat was, about the same size. Again, it's a pellet. And mice feed under cover. So they will grab food like acorns. And in this case, this is a plant called a sea rocket that they took under a log and were feeding on. But oftentimes you will find their feeding sign under cover and you can find um, small marks on the things that they've been feeding on called chatter. Our red squirrel, these guys are very cute. And uh, they have a slightly different track than the gray squirrel because Notice how long and thin those toes are, particularly on the hind track. Um, super long, thin toes and very straight, connected to the palm. And if you draw an imaginary line across the leading edge, there is, again, that, that flat edge to it. And they, they, uh, their tracks are smaller, less bulbous on the tips than the, the gray squirrels. They come to a big, uh, thick bulb at the tip, like the gray squirrel does. And these three toes are normally grouped on very closely on the tracks of the, the red squirrel. Red squirrel is related to the Douglas squirrel that I have in my area, but uh, very similar track form morphology. Again, the hind track has that typical rodent structure with four lobes on the pad and five toes on the hind. And the front, same thing, four toes. And you have the pad and a carpal pad and the metacarpal pad here with a small toe number one, which does not always show up. Unfortunately, it's that substrate dependent whether you're gonna see that. This is the bounding gate again, uh, front tracks in the center and the hind tracks on the outside. Here are some in snow, just so you can see um, how some of the details get lost in snow. But if you look at the size of the tracks and measure an individual footprint, um, you, you can, you can uh, see the typical structure here again with those three toes in the center, that one, three, one grouping that I'm talking about on the hind tracks, and then this front track shows four toes. So you can tell right off that these are rodent to rule, to, uh, excuse me, uh, sort that down to another uh, group. You, you can start with rodent because you have the four on the front and five on the hind, and then you can uh, go from there with measurements and range maps can help you narrow this down to the red squirrel. But uh, yeah, sometimes rodents, the smaller guys are tough to get down to species level. Um, so these little guys will tap into the bark of trees and this is when the uh, sap is running. And what they do is they grab a hold with their incisor teeth on the top and hold on right here. And then they scrape with the bottom incisors, a little bit longer scrape. And this will open up the bark and allow some of the sap to flow. And then they'll, they'll go away, do something else, and they'll come back after it's had the chance to uh, dry out a little bit and, and evaporate. And what that does is it allows that sap to go from about a 2% sugar content to about 55% and then they feed on it. So they're pretty smart that way. They open up the bark and come back after it's had a chance to evaporate. They also do this thing where they store uh, mushrooms in trees to dry them. So if you come along and you find mushrooms oddly placed in the branches of trees and you go, what's going on here? How'd this happen? This is a behavior of the red squirrel and the Douglas squirrel. They gather the mushrooms place them up there in the tree, let them dry out. And once the mushroom is dry, they'll store it. Because remember, these guys are larger hoarders. They store a lot of material in one uh, burrow or tree hollow. And uh, instead of being a scatter hoarder, like the gray squirrel. So that's their food resource. Now on to one of our last rodents here, the groundhog. And these little guys also have uh, tracks that look just like those of a giant squirrel, although their toes are a little bit shorter. So their toes are kind of stubby and thick compared to what we've seen with the, uh, not only the red squirrel, but the gray squirrel. So 
this is the front track right here, and this is the hind. And you can see again the three toes here, the one, three, one arrangement of toes that's typical for rodents. But uh, these guys have a little bit shorter and thicker toes, and their feet are also quite a bit larger than the other squirrels in the region. So you can tell their tracks from those of other squirrels. Again, these guys use a walking gait in which um, you have front and hind tracks on one side of the trail and then a very clear large straddle between them. And here's your front right here, and here's your hind right here. So in this case, this is an understep because the hind track is behind the front track. Direction of travel is to the upper right on your screen. If this hind track passes the front track and lands up here, that would be an overstep and that would be a faster gait than this one right here where uh, it's using an understep, which is a, a slower gait, probably used for foraging or um, if the animal is being cautious. All right, this one I think is our last uh, rodent, the porcupine. Now porcupines have these lovely little feet and I just love the texture of these guys. They have very flat soles, but they have these tiny little pebbles in there. It's just a little texture. It looks like a basketball almost. And uh, they, the thing with their tracks is they have very long claws and those claws keep their toes up off the ground. So the toes should be in here, but the toes aren't showing up because the tips of the claws are hitting the ground and the toes themselves are being held off the ground by those claws. So when you find porcupine tracks, you'll find this really wide pad. And then ahead of it, you'll find these little marks from the claws, but it's very rare to see the actual um, toe prints of a porcupine because their claws keep them off the ground. And uh, like I said, the, on the right, there is a basketball texture. And on the left, you can see that's true of the porcupine's palm just has that lovely pebbly texture. And uh, one of the theories is that that helps them get a uh, more of a grip when they're climbing. So that's one of the purposes perhaps of having that type of texture on their palms. Because they have large flat feet, a lot of times you're not going to get very clear tracks from a porcupine. Um, and because they have quills and long, long, long uh, fur hanging out, they, they will get these drag marks. You'll get these characteristic striations in their trails behind the, the feet as they're moving. And a lot of times it just looks like something brushed right through here. You may not have perfectly clear footprints, but we'll get that, that, um, that fur texture showing up in, in the sand or in the snow. In the snow, a lot of times their, their feet will leave a deeper imprint and you'll have this, this uh, sweeping fur marks in between from the, uh, the long stuff on their feet. And everybody's probably seen the sign of feeding of porcupines. As opposed to a beaver, porcupines are after the cambium layer where there's a lot of sugars and nutrients that they want. The, uh, the porcupines don't go deep into the, into the wood and they don't cut down the trees like the beaver do. So theirs is more of a surface type feeding and they remove the bark and they feed on the cambium layer. All right. And that was our last one. And I hope you have enjoyed learning a little bit. I know it was quite quick. Um, unfortunately, when you uh, don't have a lot of time, um, it's hard to teach some tracker. But if you want to participate in, in more tracking, uh, I have a group on Facebook that you're welcome to join. Um, I have a, an informational website about tracking at Nord.com. And a lot of the good photos that I have from Jonah Evans um, he also uses it in his iTrack app, which I recommend if you are into um, learning tracking and you have a phone and you want to uh, use an app. Uh, if you're on iNaturalist, I am a curator on the North American Animal Tracks database, as well as Bird Tracks and Sign on iNaturalist, both places where you can submit track finds. There's also an Animal Tracks Canada, which I have provided a link in uh, a resources document that uh, we'll, we'll give to you later. And Cyber Tracker Conservation is where you can find information on becoming certified 
as a wildlife tracker, they offer uh, worldwide certifications in tracking. And again, if you want to find books on tracking, all of these books are listed in the resources uh, that I've provided in the document that I think you're gonna get through email or we might put it in the chat, I'm not sure. I can't see the chat right now, but um, that's all I have right at the moment. And if you have any questions, uh, put them in the chat and I'm gonna end the slideshow and then we can take questions. There we go. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Kim. That was amazingly detailed and I loved uh, the photos that you had included. And Thank being you. able to annotate as well is a great way to teach and I learned so much. Yeah, there's so many tracks. It's just, you have to show what's, what's there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we will send uh, the participants um, your resources and that document okay. um, in awesome. a follow-up email. And we do have, I think, six or seven questions as well. Okay, right on. For you. So uh, the first one, um, can you suggest a good book about animal tracking? Well, I think you uh, okay. <laughs> have quite a few. Yeah, I think um, for, for your region, I think that... Uh, there's two that I recommend. Number one is the Mammal Tracks and Sign by Mark Elbrock. The second edition is out now. And that's just an excellent, uh, for all of North America, uh, it has just about every track you could want. The thing is like eight pounds. It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, 800 pages. It's really thorough. Um, another one that I recommend for that region is uh, Mammal, Mammal Tracks of Minnesota by John Papelli. And I've provided a link to that one also because Minnesota is fairly close to you and has similar overlap in species. So. Okay, great, perfect. And I know there's a list uh, too that the participants will get, so. Right, um, yeah, that, yeah. Okay, great, so uh, next question from uh, Michael. Uh, is the scent marking for territory or for mating? Uh, a little bit of both, actually. It just, it depends on the species. Um, so like with animals like mountain lions, they, they tend to use it um, both both ways to find mates and to mark out a territory. Um, bears, it's more a function of, of uh, mating than it is territory because they're not really, uh, black bears anyway, are not, not super territorial, but they will mark extensively during the mating season and then the rest of the year they won't mark. So it depends on the species, but um, a lot of them use it for both and some of them it's just one or the other. Um, there was a question about how many uh, deer um, there were. There was a slide you showed with some scat, uh, deer scat. Oh, okay. um, do you remember with that one? How many deer? Um, okay, the deer scat, that was one deer. So when deer deposit their scat, it's all deposited at once. So they might excrete 200 pellets at the same time. Uh, they'll just dump the whole thing, kind of like a horse does where all the scat comes out at once. Whereas rabbit, it's one pellet at a time over a longer period of time. Okay, great. Yeah. That's a question um, from Janet Harrison. Uh, as a member of the mustelids, is the otter gel a scent produced from the anal gland? It is. Um, actually, there's been some debate about that. And I talked to a, a local scientist that studies otters and he thinks it comes from the intestines, but it's possible that it comes from the anal glands. I don't think that it's really been you know, studied extensively enough that they know exactly where it comes from. So it, it could be either or or both. I'm not really positive on that. Um, Sounds like some research with, waiting yeah. to happen. <laughs> yeah, not really sure on that one. Uh, so also from Janet, um, do, dog do dogs leave drag marks with their toes as they are lazier than coyotes? Yeah, they can. Um, actually, dogs will make a scrape um, with their toes after they defecate sometimes, but they, they also will sometimes leave drag marks from their toes, especially in deeper substrate like uh, snow or sand, You'll, you might see a drag mark from the toes or just mostly from the claws. Mm -hmm. Although many dogs have groomed, groomed nails, so they're, <laughs> they're trimmed, but <laughs> some don't get trimmed. Okay. Um, Jen asked if squirrels remember all the places they hide food. Not always, and that's actually a good, good point because when they forget, say they plant an acorn, they might forget where it is, and that's that's a way of distributing those seeds on the landscape, and then an oak tree from go, can uh, grow from that. So squirrels 
may forget their caches or you know maybe that squirrel gets predated by a hawk and and all the the things that it planted end up growing into trees so that's uh, one way that they help distribute seeds and fulfill their ecological role mm -hmm. thanks interesting um it's from anonymous as well who is jonah edwards <laughs> Jonah Not Edwards. Sure. Oh, Jonah Evans. Sorry, Jonah okay. Evans is, uh, he's one of the evaluators for CyberTracker, and he's the author of the iTrack Wildlife app. Um, and I provided a link uh, in the tracking resources, which Aileen has put in the chat, um, to his website where you can find the app. And he, he has a, an extensive library of tracks from CyberTracker evaluations that he's conducted over the years. And so I used a lot of his photos because he's traveled more widely than I have. And so he has a lot of species, super good photos that I don't have. <laughs> so I used his so I could, yeah, I used his and I, the deal was I'm plugging his app, you know? So. Oh, great, great. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, they're great, great photos. Really, He's got us. awesome photos. <laughs> well, and yourself, you have some great photos too. Thanks. Um, Adrian says, uh, or asks, what items would you recommend to bring with you in a tracking kit? That's a good question. Okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of fun. Um, first, I would have uh, a ruler. If you don't have a ruler, um, a coin would work, or you know, something that's a standard sized object to provide scale in the photos. Um, I like to bring a magnifying glass to look at small things like rodent toes. Um, uh, you can bring a magnifying glass. I also bring a flashlight and a mirror, and those are to enhance the lighting on the track. I've got a couple of videos on YouTube on how to do that, but essentially it involves uh, blocking off the sunlight from a track and then providing low angle light across the track with either a flashlight or reflected light from a mirror to bring out the details in the track with lighting. And so I bring those two items. Um, also, a notebook to record some of your observations. A camera is helpful. Uh, most of us have cell phone cameras, and the cell phone cameras are great these days. They're taking good pictures. And then, you know, whatever things you need for safety in the field, you know, your water and stuff to keep warm and dry, things like that. But really, tracking doesn't require a lot of equipment. It's um, helpful to bring, you know, the, the basics like a ruler and then a camera would be the minimum, I think. Awesome, that's great. Uh, good tips there. Um, from Byron, uh, I am struggling a lot with differentiating the trails of shrews, mice, and voles. Any tips? Mm. Wow, shrews, mice, and voles, those are hard because they're so small to begin with. Um, mice and voles, well, shrews tend to use, have a little bit more space between the front tracks then do mice and voles if they're using a bounding gate, but they can also walk um, and shrew tracks, the size will help because shrew tracks tend to be way smaller than mice in most cases. But sometimes you're just not gonna have substrate that's gonna allow you to see that level of detail. Um, shrews do have five toes on the front feet that show up clearly, they have a long toe one, whereas mice and voles don't. Um, so that's another one. Voles often will trot, um, whereas your, your mice don't usually trot. Mice pretty consistently use a bounding gate. Sometimes they'll walk, but they're, they're very consistent using a bound rather than the other gates. So voles versus mice, I would look for the trotting gates more in the voles. And then shrews, I would just try to go by size and the width between the trails sometimes, uh, excuse me, the width between the leading front tracks sometimes will help. But sometimes you just won't be able to tell them apart. They're just, those small ones are, are very difficult. <laughs> mm -hmm. So gate and size. Kind yeah. Of there. yeah, relying on the gate clues. Awesome. Um, Sarah M says, uh, we have two black bears who are living along our creek. What should we look for in terms of when they are mating? Mm, okay, yeah, look for... Um, Around mating season, they're going to start to mark on trees a lot more. So they will form uh, what we call ritual trails where they stomp uh, their feet deeply on the ground and sort of grind their feet into the soil to um, 
leave scent from glands on their feet. So they'll make stomp trails, which are just clear uh, left, right um, arranged tracks that develop over time over the landscape. They reuse those trails over and over. They'll actually turn around and go back over the same trail several times to leave scent. They will um, mark on trees by rubbing their backs on them. They'll bite the trees over their shoulder. So look for um, marks about six feet high. It depends on you know, if it's a big bear or not, but most of them by the time they're mating, they're at least three years old. So um, look for those, the bite marks and the claw marks on trees. And um, also look for uh, bear fur snagged on the bark of those trees because they usually rub their back on the tree uh, also to leave scent. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, those are the main things. They straddle mark trees too. If you can find good enough substrate to determine that the bears have been straddling the trees, a lot of times they will urinate on them as they walk over them. And then the tree springs up behind them, um, leaving behind scent. And they're also known to grab saplings and pull them down and break them off. So they they break the tip off of the sapling. They kind of decapitate. Um, I'd say inch or two thick saplings, they, they decapitate a lot. They'll bite them and, and they'll break them off. So those are some things to look for. Wow, lots of, uh, lots of moving signs, sounds like. Bears, bears leave a lot of sign. I have a lot of those on my YouTube videos. I have a bunch of bear sign um, that you can look for. Neat, oh, let's check that out. Um, Deb asks, uh, there have been sightings of cougars in southwestern Ontario. Are the tracks similar to domestic cats? They are very similar, yeah, except for size-wise. So um, for cougars, they're going to be about the size of your palm if, if it's an adult. Um, three inches, I mean three inches, um, what is that, seven and a half centimeters approximately. So that's a small one. Um, they're gonna look very similar. They're gonna have the teardrop shaped toes. They'll have a flat palm. The leading edge of the palm will have two lobes and the trailing edge of the palm will have three lobes. And a lot of times in my experience anyway, the, the three um, lobes of the trailing edge of the palm show up clearer than the rest because of the way they walk with their front feet. They, they tend to slap the front foot down. And so that, that uh, edge of the palm hits the ground a little stronger and leaves a better imprint. But yeah, it, it looks just like the domestic cats when we mark. Okay. Um, Adrian asks, do you have any tips on determining direction of travel for drags uh, slash slides? For drags and slides? Um, usually the drag mark is going to go in the direction of travel. So um, as the animal lifts it foot, its foot, sometimes it's going to drag forward. There, if an animal is moving super fast and pushing backwards with its feet, sometimes they can fling soil backwards, but usually if they're moving slowly or they're dragging their feet, they're not, they're not doing one of those uh, slow walks, they're gonna drag forward in the direction of travel. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and another one from Adrian, uh, also kind of in terms of gait, uh, are you offering a gait analysis workshop anytime soon? If so, when and how do we sign up? Oh, interesting. I hadn't thought of that actually, but it, yeah, I might, I might think about like a doing lot of that. Interest, uh, the gate yeah. stuff is, is really interesting. Okay, that would be cool. Yeah, I think uh, I'll think about that. I, I haven't, uh, I haven't given that much thought, but yeah, that's a good idea. There you go, Adrian. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, so that's all the questions. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, yourself, Kim, for your your wonderful presentation. That was. Uh, Amazing. I learned so much. I have so many notes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm really looking forward to hopefully getting out this week. And we got some yeah, you're doing snow a, here. So you're doing a bio blitz, right? Aren't you guys having a tracking bio blitz? Uh, well, we were going to, but uh, COVID and, and we, oh, just no. we just postponed it. So it's happening on family day weekend. Uh, in February, so we're having instead of a, a walk, a tracking mm -hmm. walk, we're going to do um, self guided. We're going to go out ahead of time and find tracks, mark them, and then so you can go out at a book time and uh, learn about them. And then we have an online virtual challenge, so you can submit your tracks on iNaturalist or mm -hmm. iNaturalist. And some not everyone finds that easy. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you can just submit it to us and then there'll be like a competition and some prizes. So cool. Yeah. Sounds like fun. I'll have to have to check it out on iNaturalist and see what kind of tracks you guys find. Yeah, maybe you can uh, participate from Northern California. <laughs> exactly. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> re- remotely participate. I I do identify tracks on iNaturalist all the time. So if you guys are uh, on there, um, you'll probably see me. I'm, I'm a bear tracker on iNaturalist. I do a lot of track identification on there. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we'll give you a follow and uh, maybe right on. ID some Ooh. stuff for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tag me in any footprints that, that you're puzzled about. And I'll see if I can help. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, we'll do. If not, I know other trackers that are better than me at snow. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to believe, but most of them are snow. Most of mine are snow. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to say a shout out your Facebook group. I have learned so much from that group. Um, oh, thanks. You know, there's there's a lot of you know people that just guess, but the people that mm. there's amazing trackers on there that explain things, and I can't tell mm. you how much I've learned about tracking from following that group. So I highly recommend that group. Awesome. Thank you. That's uh, animals don't cover their tracks on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's really fun. We've got, a, we've got a bunch of cyber tracker trackers in there and uh, they're, they're really good about answering questions and, and we try to prevent the guessing as much. Um, we try to get people to state the reasons that they think a track is, is what they think it is. So hopefully it's a, a very helpful group for everybody to, to, um, to, uh, to participate in. I, I enjoy uh, meeting everybody there <laughs> and seeing all the tracks that they find too. That we had somebody post some tracks from Australia last week. Oh, wow. That was awesome. <laughs> like traveling without having to travel, right? Yeah, I know. You get to see wallaby tracks. I mean, how often do you get to see that? <laughs> That's pretty cool. I've never, I've never seen wallaby tracks in, in real life, but you know, somebody posted them on Facebook. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we I went will... to a grocery store a couple of years ago, just in Newmarket, so I'm just north of Toronto, Ontario, and somebody had um, a, a pet kangaroo on a leash. Oh my gosh. You know, looking back, it was snowing, and I thought that would have been amazing tracks uh, to find. <laughs> <laughs> oh Sometimes I've come across some crazy uh, animals on a leash, uh, a lemur. Wow. <laughs> a lemur? Oh my goodness. Yeah, oh. hopping around, so. Oh wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I would love to see Kangaroo yeah. tracks. So, all right. Um, well. So yes, we will email out um, a okay. follow up to all of the participants with um, all of your resources, Kim. Okay. Um, and with your Facebook group um, and with the recording as well, so people okay. can revisit. Um, awesome. The- that was fun. Thank you. Glad you guys oh, enjoyed thank it you so much. Oh, I enjoyed it a ton. So appreciate awesome. it a lot. Cool. Thanks. All right, no worries. Thanks so much, um, and we'll, we'll shut it down. Okay, yeah, and if you guys have questions, just, just holler on Facebook or on the, on the website, either one. Yep, will do. Always have, always have time for track questions. <laughs> <laughs>